I know this must be a, a very busy time for you both. And um, I want to thank you for coming at the end of what I understand for Bruno. Both of you has been a very busy day. Um, if you don't mind, um, uh, why don't we just jump into it? Both of you uh, give quick introductions, if you don't mind, and we'll jump right into the discussion today. Sure. Uh, hey, glad to be here. Alex Greenstein, director of the Privacy Shield uh, program at the Commerce Department. Um, we'll have to see about changing my title once the data privacy framework comes into force. Um, but definitely sort of glad to be here with Bruno. And I think that, yeah, we've made great progress and cooperation between sort of the US and the EU. And also, I mean, we're sort of, I think, past the phase of sort of negotiations. And now we're sort of working on implementation of um, the framework. And we've definitely made a lot of progress. I mean, was that what you were looking for? Yeah, yeah. But first of all, just an introduction. It's always nice. You know, as you know, we not only have our audience here, Alex, but we we broadcast this after. And so this is a great update for the community on where things stand. So I, I appreciate the introduction. And Bruno? I'm Bruno Tukari from the European Commission. I'm doing, I have to introduce my function, my job. Listening to Omer, the previous panel, I understand I do a completely useless job. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry for that uh, because I'm responsible for international relations uh, in the area of justice and consumer and one of the area we, we are covering in data flows. Um, and, uh, and in that context, I have uh, indeed uh, led the negotiations for the EU of, of the new framework. And uh, here we are. Well, great to see you. Um, I assume Omer's insult was directly intended. We'll just go with that. Um, Israeli provocation. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can discuss this later. Yeah. Now we focus on the U.S. One problem at a time. Well, listen. Why, why don't Why don't we just, if you don't mind, you know, we've we've spoken generally about the process, but you have to reach a framework agreement on the principles and the steps. And then there are different levels of approvals along the process before you get to final adequacy decision. Would you mind between the two of you giving us an update on where are we in the approval process at this point? I'll start. Um, first, what an adequacy decision is. Um, an adequacy decision is a quite um, unique instrument we have in the EU uh, legal system by which we can recognize either foreign country in its totality, in this case, a foreign framework, because US system is, is a bit complex, and uh, recognize it and assimilate it to a framework or country uh, 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 of the EU, which means that uh, data flows when this decision will be uh, adopted, if and when, uh, I think it's rather a question of when, uh, it will be adopted, uh, uh, data flows between the EU and certified companies under the uh, data privacy framework uh, will be treated as data flows uh, between Brussels, where I'm normally sitting, and I don't know, Germany, France, uh, Poland, or, or, or Spain. So uh, that's a very powerful instrument. And that's what an adequacy decision is. An adequacy decision is not an international agreement. It's a decision taken by the commission, the commission being the executive arm of uh, the European Union, and it's a power we that has been delegated to us by our legislators. So it's a, a decision we take on the basis, in this case, of commitments taken by the US and that have been expressed in US uh, legal acts, legal measures, such as the executive order uh, uh, I'm sure Alex will, will refer to. So what do we have to do uh, uh, to adopt uh, such a decision? The commission has tabled a draft decision uh, in December of last year. First step, uh, we have to, we need to obtain an opinion uh, from the European Data Protection Board. That opinion was issued at the end of February. Um, that opinion and it's very important for us. Uh, uh, clearly uh, stressed that uh, this framework bring. I think that those are the exact words. Uh, significant improvements on the two issues. I can come back to that. That were at stake in these negotiations. Necessity and proportionality meaning under which conditions, limitations, safeguards, uh, uh, intelligence agency uh, uh, can 
access uh, data that's necessity and to what extent uh, proportionality and then the possibility to for individuals to invoke those safeguards and have them uh, enforced before a, an independent and impartial uh, redress body. European Data Protection Board, which is the body that brings together our independent regulators from our 27 uh, uh, member countries, has issued that opinion. The next uh, step is for us to obtain a green light and approval from uh, our uh, member states, the, the representative of the governments of our 27 member countries, uh, and then we can adopt the decision. And uh, once the decision will be adopted, uh, uh, companies will be able to rely on it to transfer data to uh, the US, to uh, uh, the uh, PF certified companies, but also what is very important is that decision has been, that that, that uh, framework has been negotiated so that it will apply to all transatlantic data flows across the board, regardless of the instrument, the mechanism you will be using, standard contractual clauses or binding corporate rules. Um, we are right now, where we are on the process, we are right now looking at the opinion we have received from the European Data Protection Board, and that, yes, clearly uh, stressed the significant improvements, but also um, uh, made a number of comments, expressed requests for clarification, additional elements. So we are uh, amending our decision uh, 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 so that it, we believe, uh, can uh, answer to the questions raised by the European Data Protection Board before uh, uh, proceeding uh, in that process. In, uh, and, and as I said, next step is seeking a vote from our, our member states. Uh, when this will happen and when we will have a decision, you and you will you will have understood from 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 uh, from what I've just explained that this is for good reason system of check and balance, not a process which is entirely under our controls and in our hands. But we believe, if all goes well, we can adopt that decision, uh, adopt that decision. Sorry, before the summer. Uh, last point, for this to happen, and this will be a perfect transition uh, to Alex. Uh, we have to do some homework, and we are doing that homework, but the US uh, government uh, has also uh, some homework to do. Um, just one example, uh, one of the important feature element of this new framework is the creation of a, of a redress body, the Data Protection Review Court. Well, uh, for Europeans to be able to bring complaints uh, 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 before that, that redress body, they need to be, that's the legal term, uh, the EU needs to be designated so that it's, it's citizens, it's individuals, persons whose data will be transferred to the US uh, will be able to, to have access to that body. Well, that decision uh, still needs to be taken uh, by the Attorney General. And uh, uh, for it's essential that that decision uh, end, is taken because that will make effective uh, the, the new redress body. And uh, we will... Uh, adopt the decision and, and, and make it enter into, into application only when to that and other pieces will be in place. But we are working closely uh, with the US government that, so that this can indeed happen in, in the coming months. Alex? All right. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely sort of we are sort of working on the designation and the attorney general sort of um, we're having discussions around that and sort of the timing and what that will look like. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely sort of working on implementing the commitments that we made sort of in the executive order around the data privacy framework. Um, the Department of Justice is moving forward with standing up the data privacy um, review court. Um, you may have seen actually it was a couple of months ago, I think they started advertising a job that would actually be um, managing sort of like, you know, the back end functions of the court, sort of essentially kind of a court clerk for that they're working to identify sort of uh, potential judges for um, that. Um, so that's sort of moving forward at the same time, sort of the intelligence community is working on essentially transposing the commitments that we made in the executive order around necessity and proportionality um, into um, operational guidance. So there's going to be um, a, each intelligence agency will need to sort of adopt their own sort of implementing procedures for that. That process is moving forward quicker than I um, expected, pleasantly surprised there. Um, also, in terms of the Commerce Department, we are sort of uh, moving forward with a lot of other sort of implementing procedures. Uh, you may have seen 
late last week, we uh, put out a federal register, actually two federal register notices, um, and that will sort of enable us to collect information in order to run the data privacy framework as a um, uh, certification mechanism, because um, we need that permission to um, collect data from the public on that. And then also there was another one about um, standing up the um, collecting information for the, um, pardon me, it's uh, been a long day, uh, <laughs> for, the, um, for the arbitration mechanism. And then sort of the other aspect that we are working on is we are, we've gotten permission to um, set up a new domain name for the data privacy framework. Um, so, and then also we're working with our contractors to stand up the website um, because there will be sort of a transition from the privacyshield.gov website to data privacy framework. Um, and then also we are getting permission from the Office of Management and Budget to um, collect fees for the data privacy framework because it is a new um, framework. So, so there's a whole lot of like- you know, It's a lot of stuff, a lot of activity going on between the two. And in terms of making the dance work all together, Alex and Bruno, so which of the various things that you talked about are preconditions to being able to put the- framework up for a final vote by the member states is that is it only some of them are are necessary to be in place before you could proceed it sounds like if i were to summarize between it there's some revisions going on on the adequacy decision based on the feedback from the board and in parallel there may be a few things that have to be finally nailed down from the eus side before you can take the um the whole framework to a vote bruno is that correct well, certainly these things have to be put in place so that the framework uh, is adopted and becomes and enters into force. Because an adequacy decision, by definition, is a snapshot of a certain system. And it's about saying that system, at a certain point of time, offers those safeguards, those protections, effectively. So what Alex described uh, are things that look uh, like a long list of uh, quite bureaucratic steps, but that they are, are that are essential to to give life uh, to to, uh, to to the framework. So that will be essential uh, for uh, the framework to uh, the decision to be adopted and entered into force. We are working closely on the sequencing because ideally, and I think it should be like this: uh, we adopt the framework uh, when all of this has been done, so that it can immediately enter. Uh, into force. Politically, I think there's an angle here, I and mean, it's important when some of the things that Alex said, that again, might look like bureaucratic steps, but that, I mean, what you're talking about- By the way, I, I didn't mean to minimize. Essential no. Is, uh, no, 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 I didn't mean to minimize. I no, hope no, I didn't no, come that, across that. No, no, I'm, I'm saying that uh, uh, not, this is not to minimize, minimize, but I understand that a lot of what we both say might look like, you know, yeah. Uh, uh, to government officials using their jargons and, uh, and listing of it. But um, what Alex was saying uh, about, for instance, policies and I mean, each and every intelligence agencies and how many of them there are in the US? Or I think 17. 17. That so, uh, so that's CAA, NSA, but many others. Taking the executive order and adapting their way of operating on the ground their internal rules and policies to adapt them to those new safeguards in terms of necessity and proportionality is very significant work, essential work for this for this framework to, to mean something on the ground, but essentially it's a lot of work. It involves also the P Club, which I understand yes. is consulted by each of these agencies uh, uh, when they develop those, 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 those internal uh, rules and policies. So that's a lot of work which is happening right now. And I think it's also very important for our own uh, uh, decision-making process, when we're talking to uh, the data protection authorities, when we're talking to uh, the government of our member states, when we're talking to the European Parliament, this shows that this brings real changes. Otherwise, I think the 17, yeah. I, I think the 17 U.S. intelligence agencies, if they could choose, uh, meaning, uh, meaning they probably would prefer to do uh, other things, but this shows that uh, uh, though that executive order that was adopted, signed by uh, President Biden on the 7th of October of 7th of October last year, brought changes, new safeguards that now needs to be implemented before uh, by each and every, and every uh, intelligence agency. Yeah. 
that's what this work means in practice. Yeah, and it's also just sort of demonstrating that, I mean, this isn't just sort of a political deal. I mean, certainly there's a political element to it, and there's like sort of an issue of trust and sort of under mutual understanding on these issues, but this is a very practical sort of enterprise, and that sort of before the summertime, we are working to sort of make sure that all of this will be in place and ready to go. And so that's sort of where, yeah, we're definitely sort of coordinating very closely on making sure that sort of all the like necessary elements are in place there so that the commission can finalize their adequacy um, decision. And if I may add, this is also important link to, again, I was uh, chatting with my dear colleague, Carolina, but I was still listening to the uh, previous panel and I understood there were a lot of questions about litigation. Well, I cannot uh, speculate on whether there will be a legal challenge, I hear a lot of people say that there will be a legal challenge. I can certainly not speculate on how what will be the outcome of the legal challenge. What I can say is that we believe we, we, we can credibly defend this framework. And this work would be very important in terms of if and when there will be a legal challenge to show that uh, those safeguards indeed uh, are not just a part of a political deal, still has been reflected in an executive order uh, uh, adopted by the US president, but that then those safeguards have been uh, uh, implemented by each and every intelligence agencies in a close consultation with an independent oversight body, which is the, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. So all, all of this is also important in view of that uh, possible court case. Yeah, I mean, the, I think it's meaningful for, for everybody to hear, Alex and Bruno, just how much actually goes in to the changes and practical implementation of what has happened on this new framework. It's it's pretty massive if you actually just listen to all of the effects on the actual, it may not, it, some, sometimes it's not obvious all of the uh, effects. Bruno and Alex, for, for, you know, for a lot in the community, I think there's an excitement that it would actually go into effect and that companies could start certifying under it. It's been a little hard to predict when that might be. You know, and what the where it is in in having um, you know some momentum behind it to get done by a certain date, and that was the source of the question, Bruno. Like, which of them is must sort of happen before you take the final adequacy determination? Because obviously, you could have an adequacy determination that's also it's determined conditioned on sure. fulfillment of steps. So I just didn't know which. That's, which yeah that's a possibility yeah but in terms of I mean, everybody is uh waiting and we owe everybody stability and legal certainty so i would prefer and that's what also we 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 are discussing and yeah. when we are discussing secrecy to adopt the adequacy decision which has to be adopted by uh, uh, the College of the Commission, which is the, the political leadership of the Commission, and have it enter into force uh, the next day, because that's possible. That's what, what we can do. But for that, we need those pieces to be in place. I think that would be much better in terms of in the, in the injecting trust, injecting legal certainty, injecting stability. That's something that is adopted and then which is then conditioned uh, upon something else which then uh, raises the question of when it becomes, when that something can happens, uh, who takes the decision that that something has has happened and when. So that's uh, uh, what uh, we, uh, that's why I think it would be important for, for US government and friends. And indeed there's a lot of work. I mean, we are here in a nice place <laughs> and, and talking to you, but actually there are people doing the real work. And, uh, uh, but in, it's indeed important that that works uh, goes, goes fast, yes. Yeah, no, definitely. And we are very much, um, yeah, I mean, the U.S. government really wants to get this done as quickly as possible because certainly, I mean, yeah, this uncertainty around data transfers we've had for, what, two years now is, yeah, untenable. And it really has had an impact on companies. And we want to sort of end that and restore stability to this. And so that's why we're trying to move forward as quickly as possible. And yeah, I mean, getting this done before sort of the uh, summertime would be a... Uh, very positive uh, step forward. That would be welcome. Well, good luck. I mean, I know there's a lot going on and uh, the implementation side of it is not minor on either yeah. side. And even going out, you have, you know, both of you with your colleagues across a broad group, you actually have to go to the member states 
and explain the framework and how it accommodates. And you have to go to the parliament and you have to go to the to the council. I mean, that's all that's just a lot of advocacy yeah. that has to be done to get it done. So um I'm hoping you prove me right on my prediction that it's less than five months, but I will not put it to you, Bruno, uh, on getting it. Yeah, yeah, correct. So I gave you all the way through the summer. So, yeah, yeah, summer starts uh, on uh, the 21st of uh, June. Yes, and uh, ends the 21st of uh, By the way, you, you have uh, a very uh, definitive uh, definition of the summer. I didn't know uh, that it was so clear. But... At least one thing is clear. Yeah. <laughs> Data flows, but uh, that's a that's a it, yeah. it, it, it flows with the data. But that is one one concrete. Yes. Yeah. But I think also sort of like one positive here as well is also that, yeah. I mean, we are firmly sort of in the phase of sort of implementing these things and sort of, yeah. We definitely sort of like you know it was sort of negotiating this took time and it was definitely difficult to sort of like you know reach sort of a way to sort of address the concerns raised by Shrems to in a manner that worked within the U.S. legal system. But we were able to do that and reach something that sort of both our, um, the U.S. and the European Commission were able to sort of, um, yeah, find common ground on. And I think that's really significant. I mean, now sort of we're, yeah, we have to do this hard work of implementation, but that's, yeah, that's more positive than sort of uh, still sort of negotiating how to sort of um, address the concerns raised in the court's decision. And that's just another point. Uh, a new day important part about implementation. You said it. It was for us fundamental. It's a question, first of all, of, 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 of rule of law, of complying with the judgment of uh, a decision of the highest court in Europe and the highest court in, in the land, you would say here. Uh, uh, um, but also to have something which is effective in a foreign system, which is, of course, different, which has its own mechanism, its own constitutional framework. And, and, and that's where the implementation uh, 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 is is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, again, um, uh, if we are in litigation, but even if we are thinking about litigation, we will win this if we can show that this is not only a deal on paper in the books, but that it can uh, uh, protect individuals and it can also enable individuals to, if they have doubt, concerns, <laughs> uh, uh, bring claims, bring their complaints and have them uh, remedied if, if, if something wrong has happened. And for that, you need the implementation, yeah. I mean, so first of all, thank you. It's an important update. And one of the benefits of having you all join at the end of the day, first of all, I can catch you hopefully a little weak from many, many other panels today and maybe spring some other subjects on you. But we do you mind if I... The, the I yeah, you yeah, did yeah. to Virginia. This is a, this is exciting moment for exactly. both of you. I assume <laughs> neither of you have, have so made it... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, Marylanders, Italy, so you, you might know this, Bruno, but Marylanders never cross into Virginia. That's actually not, uh, that's rarely permitted. And and welcome for you, one of the first Italian uh, Brussels EC representatives to also make it into Virginia. We're, we're excited to have you here. There were a lot of subjects that came up today that talk, that touch on items that are, are part and parcel of your remits. Do you mind if I, if I, by the way, uh, we covered this before, but you're both in the government. We understand you're limited. You can't sometimes cover certain subjects. You have to bear insults like you did from Omer on yes. the entire. And he's a, he have a, he had to say he has that. Yeah, yeah. He's, he insults <laughs> and then runs. Yes. Um, I'll I'll put a couple of quick items on the table. First of all, um, the the national privacy law. We there was a predictions panel we had earlier today where there's a broad consensus that there will be no national law here in the U.S. But Alex, out of the U.S. Department of out of, out of the FTC, there's been a set of public um, notices and comment around the possibility of implementing some privacy regulations just as a matter of FTC fairness authority and the NTIA, I know entered comments on that. I know neither of those are your, your, your part of commerce, but that attracted a lot of attention, you know, the ability to bring through uh, fairness authorities some, um, you know, broader privacy regulation. Can you comment a little bit on that FTC process to the extent you, you're aware of it um, and, and the NTIA comments, Alex? And by the yeah. way, if, if you can, I'm happy to, to move on to other, other subjects. 
you know, I mean, I can't say anything particular about it, but I mean, definitely sort of we are supportive and the U.S. government would like to see sort of like, you know, developments in uh, privacy protections. And certainly I think the sort of like FTC exercising their authorities and sort of moving forward and like you know, responding to sort of the current privacy environment is a positive. And FTC has definitely sort of been a strong partner um, for both the EU and the US in terms of privacy shield and will be once again with the data privacy framework. And so to the extent that sort of they're exercising their authorities, I think that's a net positive for um, EU US data transfers because a lot of times when they're doing, when they've been conducting investigations about things domestically, they'll also look into it and see whether or not this impacted sort of um, EU consumers. Um, who are using U.S. services. So, well, And the framework here, Alex, is really important. The more privacy protection there is generally and enforcement in a country like the United States, the easier it is to have public reasons why you might have an adequacy decision because there's more enforcement. And um, but But the FTC yeah. side of it has been kind of an interesting theory, right? Which is even in the absence of a federal law that you might have greater enforcement through some kind of rulemaking, you know, was an interesting. Yeah. But uh, just one other point there. I mean, definitely sort of like having sort of improvements and sort of like, you know, and greater privacy protections in the commercial sphere in the United States is certainly helpful and I think is well received sort of in Europe. But I mean, what we negotiate in terms of the DPF, I mean, was largely focused on national security. I mean, that was sort of in the court did not raise any concerns about the commercial protections that were offered by Privacy Shield. That's a that's so a really that's, important um, point. Yeah, this is really about the redress and other mechanisms on the national security front. But it's a good color framework around it, yeah. right? I mean, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I think it's important for two reasons. First, because it's true we have focused on national security access because that, those were the reasons for, uh, for which previous uh, framework, the privacy shield was first. But we have also learned a lot from the annual reviews of the privacy shield, from the role the Department of Commerce, who, as you know, has a central role in, in, in certifying companies and, and administrating that, that administrating that, that process, but also the FTC play. And I, I think we have built, that was not, the, it's not the center of the attention, but we have built on some of these improvements on some of these lessons that have now been sort of codified uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the privacy principles and therefore in our, in our DECOS decision. And this brings us, I think this brings us to another aspect which goes beyond the, the data privacy framework, is enforcement cooperation. I think, and Omer will agree with me because now he's back. And uh, yes, in this area, like in many legal areas, we are often uh, uh, struggling with fiction, whether all of it is, is, is a fiction or is something real. We are talking about rules that really matter. And I'm always surprised that uh, in, in privacy compared to other regulatory areas, antitrust, financial supervision, there is very little enforcement cooperation between uh, Europeans, regulators, uh, the FTC, other regulators around the world, which are addressing very often the same commercial practices uh, and very often are dealing with the same companies. If there's a, for instance, a data breach, it very often simultaneously affects uh, many jurisdictions, dozens, if not millions, of consumers uh, at the same time in several jurisdictions. I think that cooperation, if uh, there would be true uh, enforcement cooperation that goes beyond uh, meeting in a nice place uh, for a nice conference, uh, if there would be true enforcement cooperation, that would bring the type of trust, um, the sort of sense of ownership. These are principles we enforce together, we inter interpret together that would also uh, I think give more strength and more stability to something like uh, the data privacy uh, framework. There's a certain disconnect right now between um, what we do, our joint efforts, how much it is commented, including by regulators uh, and the opinion of the European Data Protection Board on one hand, and how little it is, this then it is done on that basis. Uh, in terms of true uh, 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 enforcement cooperation, we have some some good dialogue now with yeah. the STC on what on, on consumer law matters. I hope this will extend, including to maybe 
uh, and, and enforcement cooperation agreement, that this will accentuate the privacy. And I think, again, this can help in the, in the medium long term. Yeah, and that's actually like a very good point. That's sort of one of the things I'm hoping for is that, yeah, once we get sort of the DPF in place and the adequacy um, process is finalized, I mean, then we can sort of return to sort of focusing on the sort of regular business of sort of running this framework and cooperating on sort of commercial privacy, which is sort of the place where you're most likely to see sort of things that impact on individuals' privacy is, I mean, also we've had a lot of those annual reviews were quite helpful. I mean, we had a lot of really good conversations with the commission, but also with the DPAs. And one of the things that came up there was that there's a lot of commonality in terms of experiences. I mean, we see a lot of the same trends in terms of dealing with compliance issues and sort of like, you know, uh, and trying to sort of help companies understand their obligations. And this was something that sort of the DPAs also recognize. And it was one of those sort of moments where you sort of realize, hey, we've had the same kind of experience here. Um, and so, yeah, it would be nice to sort of return to that and sort of not have sort of the national security issues, which needed to be dealt with, um, sucking the air out of the room. No, I, I, it makes a ton of sense. And you're right. Obviously, once you get to the point of adequacy and you're not focused on the first phase, you can cooperate and collaborate and start sharing. I'll, I'll tell you another subject that bears on it, and it did come up in the context of international data transfer. On probably three or four panels today, the concept of, well, what about data transfers to Russia or data transfers to um, China and some of the not postings, but maybe the telemetry, the location data, the sort of behavioral data that might be going to, you know, countries, Bruno, outside of the United States. And sometimes when we bring up this question, it's brought up comparatively. Hey, and but I, I don't want to bring it up comparatively. Like set aside that you, you know, there's been great progress made between the United States and the European Commission, and we're going to go through a pro, pro, you know process Ignore the U.S. side for a moment and just focus between you both on the transfer of data that may be going on from various apps either to or or products to Russia or China. You know, there is there is interest in whether that's going to be a focus for either the European enforcement side or the, you know, the Americans, obviously, um, either on their export control laws or other frameworks. Do you have any reaction to that in turn? In, 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 you know, setting aside the U.S. for a moment? No, briefly, nobody uh, uh, talks about adequacy decision with respect to, to China and Russia. So we're talking about very... very oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean to confuse very, that. Very, yeah. very, very different things. Um, a few words um, on, on this. Um, he, it is interesting that... Uh, uh, was not true a few, a few years ago, both the US and, and the EU and many others think about Japan and data free flow with trust, where trust is trust in essentially in how government access data and, 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 and process data. Um, the EU, the US and others, two different angles, but we also have the privacy angle, we have the cybersecurity angle, we have the export control angle, are increasingly considering that privacy is, oh, privacy, or more broadly, what you do with data basically, is an essential component of that dividing line between like-minded democracy, let's call them, and, and authoritarian regimes. Uh, days ago, there was a summit for democracy. It's interesting that uh, uh, one of the uh, topic was uh, for, that led to a joint statement was on the use of spywares, of commercial spywares. Uh, and that's felt as a you know, quite important issue uh, that uh, uh, makes some, makes us different from others if, uh, in, in, in the way we might use or not use uh, uh, those technologies. Uh, so I think that's good. That has led to the OECD, the OECD process uh, that uh, has um, led for the first time at international level to a series of principles agreed at international levels on safeguards, uh, uh, conditions uh, uh, on the basis of which government can access data for reasons such as law enforcement and national security. Very much equaling what we have done in more detail, meaning oversight, necessity, proportionality, uh, redress. 
In terms of enforcement, I think that, well, if I may say so, EU US data flows have been victim of their success. I think the US for a long time combined two features, dominance of uh, the digital economy and a very sophisticated, extended national security intelligence apparatus architecture. And that brought a lot of attention and that brought to those cases uh, and that type of litigation. But it's no longer true. You have today, uh, because of the emergence of major tech actors coming from other regions of the world, including uh, uh, from uh, some of the countries you've mentioned, you have enforcement cases before regulators right now that concern their public uh, companies such as TikTok or others. But you will see that more and more. Uh, and uh, and and you see those cases also in the US. Yeah. Again, to the privacy angle, to other uh, 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 parts of uh, consumer law, or to the to 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 to, to all the, the angles you have, you know, the different angles you, you have mentioned. So yes, we're seeing this, and we'd see more of this. That's for sure. Yeah, and I think that's sort of like you're correct. I mean, the OECD process really. I mean, we were both there sort of when that started a couple of years ago, and it really has sort of borne fruit in terms of. Yeah, you're starting to see the outlines of sort of agreed sort of almost rules of the road. I mean, what do democracies do in this space? What are the appropriate sort of um, guardrails around sort of government access to data? And that really does sort of draw a clear distinction about sort of what sort of countries in the EU and US and Japan do on this and sort of the lack of sort of any limitations from authoritarian countries. And also, I, mean, I think that's getting sort of greater recognition, even outside of sort of like, you know, laws on sort of restricting data flow is just a sort of a additional risk for companies. I mean, I think that people are sort of starting to think about this in terms of, yeah, maybe that is sort of a risk factor in terms of being a good um, safeguarding sort of the personal data that's been entrusted to you. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. And I listen, I mean, over the last five, 10 years, you've seen a huge growth in other countries digital infrastructure and digital application development bruno you know i think there are certain countries among the ones i mentioned that people are asking why is you know what you know why aren't some of the plaintiffs challenging the eu's us frameworks why aren't they challenging other parts of the world that's not within your control but i'm but just saying doing it. They're doing yeah it right now as we speak they're doing it yeah and and some of the regulators and and um you know Kian O'Brien was talking today about some he could, couldn't speak obviously very much detail but that there are investigations going on to other transfers and that's important it's important just for people to understand that there's more going on uh Bruno do you mind if I I, I bring up one thing outside of the privacy space just briefly which is I know it's shocking but your office is part of the group um maybe leading in the European Commission around some of the humanitarian efforts in Ukraine. Um, and, you know, I think folks may not realize how broad the remit of your office is. Do you mind talking about that a little bit in addition to data transfers? Well, and, I work at the Director General for, for Justice and, and Consumer, which does a, a number of things. It's, if you want, it's the equivalent of the Department of Justice and an agency for consumer rights, if we can uh, compare this uh, um, uh, to a national level. And indeed, many, so, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a director general, we are part of the uh, play a certain role in the uh, EU response to the uh, illegal uh, aggression of Russia against Ukraine. And that ranges from questions that concern, for instance, uh, the freezing and seizing of assets, uh, to uh, the contribution of EU to uh, complex matter, but an essential matter when we are thinking about the post-war situation, which we hope will come soon, accountability. Uh, uh, it uh, touches upon uh, very concrete things. You know, of course, the, the EU has uh, been uh, uh, hosting uh, uh, many of our member states, and in particular those close to Ukraine, uh, many refugees uh, from, from Ukraine. So, for instance, in, in, in the Director General for Justice and Consumer, we have specific policies in terms of uh, children's rights that has been uh, uh, become very relevant, unfortunately, in a very uh, tragic context, uh, because you have all heard uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, what uh, has and now this is even the subject of an indictment by, by the International uh, Criminal Court. Uh, uh, what has happened? What is happening uh, to uh, children uh, um, in uh, in Ukraine and outside Ukraine and, and in Russia? So, make like, all of this like, is part of a a uh, contribution of the EU to the response uh, to to that aggression, which. Um, shows, hey, talking about this, when we're talking about data flows, but uh, uh, seems a bit, uh, but uh, shows that uh, these policies, if I'm sorry, I will say that differently, we'll say this differently. For us, it was very important to show that uh, certain instruments in terms of law enforcement cooperation, in terms of uh, protection of uh, certain uh, vulnerable, vulnerable uh, part of the population of such children, that were developed in a complete different context, uh, in a context that was given as a given, um, could be quickly adapted uh, to address uh, such a crisis and such a, a, a tragedy. So that's, um, yes, that's what's happening right now. <laughs> it does put a lot of other things in, obviously, in, in serious perspective. And um, well, listen, I, I know we're getting to the end of time. It was an, a really terrific update. Are there any questions folks want to cover from? Yep. One question. I think there's commonality of interest that when the lawsuit was brought the day after it happened, and then there's certain things that were contained in the period, you can speak to this, whether or not one of the things that's being looked at is that as part of the self certification by US companies under the DPF, is there any thought to certification of technical measures such as the Court of Justice has said would be helpful? Because it would go to like the EDCB's concern about further processing and those kinds of things. So there's quite a bit of body of law of technical measures. And in the self certification process, that's a great opportunity for the US to kind of reach across the Atlantic and say, when you self certify to the DPF, you're certifying views and technical measures to also completely remove from what the U.S. government is doing to help ensure that your operation processing of this data is also appropriate. I mean, I think that's something that sort of there's been sort of discussion about sort of like you know, technical measures in the context of sort of like you know, the SECs and guidance for like you know, companies. But I mean, I don't think that sort of in terms of the data privacy framework, um, we're prepared to sort of, I guess, specify sort of like, you know, what types of sort of uh, technologies. great opportunity to show that there's coherence with what the DPP has said with their justice. But I think the layout, oh, pardon. No, sorry. But, but